All right, let's get started. Um, so it's a little different today. I am going to use a, a Jupyter notebook, but there isn't like a class version of it. Um, partially because, actually even mostly because I'm going to kind of go through uh, kind of a use case using stuff that we're going to be doing over the next like two weeks. And I want to work through those individual kind of pieces while we're doing them, if you know what I mean. So that, um, you know, rather than kind of giving you the necessary code now, um, because it will, I think it'll be hard to, it'll be harder to learn it if you kind of learn it halfway through, if you know what I mean. So hopefully you can follow along, but there won't be much uh, kind of in the way of programming for all of you today. Um, this is also something I was going to start experimenting with, see how this looks. Um, but, oh, that does actually fit pretty well. That's cool. All right. So uh, let's see. That seems right. Uh, just kind of a reminder, uh, checkpoint two is due today. Uh, if you haven't already done it, project two. Uh, hmm. I don't know. Let's go with reverse. I was not expecting it to change my position though. All right, so checkpoint two is due today. Uh, and then um, the full project is due the Friday after break. Okay, and homework five is due on the Tuesday after break. The syllabus knows uh, if you are unclear. Um, remember there'll be one more homework uh, after that, which will actually be due on the last day of classes on which we do not have lecture. So just kind of keep that in mind. It'll be due on the Monday. Because for some reason this semester we're ending on a Monday. I don't really understand. Um, what else? Any questions about other stuff that I might have forgotten? Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I have to oh, was it on Gradescope? Oh, I saw that. Oh, uh, it wasn't supposed to get released. Um, that was a mistake. Um, I need to go check the dates again. I must have miscalculated. Um, there's uh, one more lab and one. There might be two more labs and one more homework. Um, and their next lab, what I'm shooting actually to do is try to have the next lab actually be on Google Colab to try to get us off the SCC so we have a little bit less pain, but we'll see how productive I am over Thanksgiving break to make that work. Um, and, uh, you know, so if, if we do, we'll do it in a lab first so that you'll all kind of have a place to learn how to do it without having like a deadline immediately do. Um, any other questions? All right. Cool. All right, so let's move on. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is load this, which is going to take a while. Um, but so what we're going to talk about today is uh, some blue bikes data. You can get actually why don't we? Oh wow, that was quick. Um, I guess everybody else is also on break, and so therefore my cluster is uh, performing much better than normal. Um, hopefully this is. Let me just make sure it's the same as the one I'm looking at. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. So I don't, I didn't kind of put any out there. Um, the, you know, most of the code you should recognize. We've done a lot of it. And then the stuff that we haven't done yet, we'll do over the next two weeks. So, or, you know, once we're back from break. All right. So as far as I'm concerned, this whole kind of exercise is where the fun stuff really starts uh, when we're doing data science, where we start to try to figure out uh, things about data. So all of the blue bikes data, and I will show you real quick if you if you're not on if how many of you are familiar with Kaggle? K-A-G-G-L-E. All right. So check out Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle is a place that uh, collects like data science sets or data sets for data science. Um, I'll just con conflate all those things into one word. Um, and they not only have a whole bunch of cool data sets, they also have a whole bunch of like cool Jupyter notebooks and people like showing how to do things on various data sets. And then on top of that, they actually hold competitions where you can win like real cash money. Um, and so you can go and participate if you want to. So it's kind of like a hackathon, except kind of ongoing all the time. Uh, no pressure, but it might be fun to do. And like I said, you can win some money. Um, there's a bunch of other sites uh, that I don't, I'm not aware of any ones that do competitions as well, but lots of other data sets uh, that are kind of available for public consumption with various ideas. Um, this is, we're supposed to be putting together a list of uh, kind of resources like this. Um, it was just that one popped into my head because this is another common data set source if you live in Boston, which probably all of you do. Um, so 
as you can see, there's 238 data sets all about Boston here that are all publicly accessible, pretty clean for the most part, so they're pretty usable. Um, but one of the things that's here, although it's kind of like linked to from here, it's actually on another website, but whatever, it kind of uh, surfaces other ones too, but is the blue bike data. So you all know what blue bikes are, right? We've talked about them before. Um, and as you might imagine, there is a ton of data in those, right? Um, and so we're going to talk about a little bit of one. This particular set of data that I have has uh, almost 900,000 records, okay? And this is me after I cut it down a ton, okay? So, like, this is much, much smaller. This data set is um, periodically not that clean, as you might imagine, because just because of its scale. So it tends to have some messy data in it. So I cleaned it up um, somewhat. Hopefully I caught it all, but you never know. Um, but so the first thing I want to do is start to take a look at, okay, let's get a sense of this data set. Uh, and so we take the max of, um, and so one of the things, let me point out here a little bit. This is the length of an individual trip in minutes. Okay, so how long was the bike not locked up, right? Um, and then this is what it actually, the start time of it, and that's the actual stop time of it, uh, year, month, day, and then the time. Um, and it's, yeah, it's in 24 hour time. Uh, just so you know, uh, especially if you come from not the U.S., um, year, month, day is the international format for dates, okay? So if you see this, or actually if you see, there's not a good example, but if you see 0102, right? So you know it's not February 1st, it's actually January 2nd. Um, so, but those are always pretty consistently, that's the format you'll see for dates. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, if you're ever uh, storing anything on your computer, um, if you use these dates ahead of things, so often like if I'm giving a talk or something, I'll uh, put the date in the name, right? So I'll put the date and then I'll say, you know, uh, you know, Fedora conference, blah, right? Um, and that way they'll actually automatically sort when you list the directory because they'll sort correctly than if you use um, dates the way like Americans normally write them. So super handy um, if you haven't run into it before, but this is the station that it started at. Right, this is the lat long of it. This is the station that it stopped at. Um, and it's lat and long as well. And then there's this bike ID. So each bike has a unique identifier. Okay, and that's one of the things we're gonna pay attention to in this. Um, and then another thing is uh, each bike usage has a type, like a user type. So I can't remember, oh yeah, so subscriber and customer. So it's kind of like the difference between somebody who pays monthly, right? Or somebody who pays kind of one-off. Um, so maybe there's some interesting different uh, usage types, depending on the type of user, for example. Um, and then this is actually the birth year of the user and then the gender of the user. I want to say it follows census. So it's like zero for unknown, one for men and two for women. Um, but I can't remember exactly. We're not using it today, so it doesn't really matter. But that gives you the idea. So what I wanted to look at was the duration of the uh, trips. Okay. And so we see we have the longest trip ever is uh, seven million minutes, or seven and a half million minutes. So that that seems to me like maybe the bike got stolen. What do you think, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's a really long bike ride. Um, and then the minimum is 61 minutes, okay? And so uh, that's, now I'm second guessing myself. Is it minutes or seconds? 61 minutes seems long for a very, for the smallest bike ride. So it must be seconds. So 7.7 7, 7 million seconds, ugh, 61 seconds for the shortest one. So somebody took it out for a minute, right? And then put it right back in. Um, and then we have our average, which is whatever, about 1400. You couldn't see my screen before. Um, and then I think that's the median over there. Let's see. Oh no, that's the number of rows. So that's how many records do we actually have? Um, let's do the median as well, because that would be useful. I don't know if it's going to like this break, but whatever, we'll see what happens. Come on. All right, and so, 
Anybody else notice that there doesn't seem to be a new column? Let's run through those. Let's try this. There we go. All right. So let's see. So that's the max, that's the minimum. This is the median, right? And then the average, and then the number of rows we have in total. As you can see, as you probably would expect, right, with the with bike usage, the median and the average aren't very close. Why would that be? Any ideas? Yes, but why why in this particular data set do we kind of expect the median and the mean not to be very close together? Like what kind of outliers or what what do you think is happening with the trip durations that would make it so the median and the mean aren't very close together? Other ideas? The trips Other way around, trips tend to be shorter, right? Um, so, so you have, uh, you know, enough really long trips, right? That they're skewing the average higher, right? But then, but in fact, most of the trips are actually shorter, right? As you might imagine, right? People use the bike, blue bikes to like commute to work, right? But they, they pick it up, they ride to work and then they drop it off, right? They don't keep it the whole day for the most part. So what we can do is we can apparently forget a step. Um, so what I'm gonna do though, is I wanna look at how long every bike was actually used, okay? And so in order, I, in order to do that, right? What I'm gonna do is actually add up the trip duration uh, when I group by bike ID. So that way, if I take a minute, but so this way I can kind of say, okay, for any given bike, how much time did it spend being ridden, I guess, or at least not locked up, right? Or not in the, the little machine. Um, and so we can see bike ID two has, uh, whatever that is, uh, 10 million seconds give or take. Um, and, you know, and then it kind of goes up from there. Uh, and so what we can do to try to get some visibility into that earlier point is we can throw it into a scatter plot. Okay. And this is kind of interesting, right? So we have all these bike IDs going across the bottom. And then we have these trip durations. Um, and they seem to vary quite a lot, right? Um, but lower number bikes seem to have longer sets of trip durations than higher number bikes, right? So any theories as to why that might be? The smaller. Out in the suburbs or something? Yeah, yeah so that's a good theory. I didn't think of that one. Um, but uh, I was going for something maybe a little simpler. How many bikes do you think um, they decided to start with? 7,000? Or do you think they started with, go ahead. Right, and the bike IDs are sequential, right? So every time they add a bike, right? its trip duration starts at zero, right? Because it hasn't been ridden yet, but it probably has a high bike ID, okay? So what this makes me think, right, is that these, the, they are allocated sequentially. Another theory, which could be perfectly plausible, is that, that it is the distribution of the bikes, is that somehow the bike ID actually indicates where it is generally used, okay? I, you know, I think either one could be, is totally plausible. But the first one I thought of was the bike IDs, lower numbers means they've been in use longer because it was assigned earlier, right? Because they don't know what the bike ID is going to be for bike, you know, 6,007 because they haven't gotten it yet, okay? Um, what about these gaps here, right? Any theories about why there's like gaps? So they probably deployed the bikes in waves. So that's a pretty good one. There's another, uh, the other side of that story. Again, 
perfectly plausible, I think very sophisticated. And, and so I would lean towards a simpler answer. Any other ideas? Well, they've got, they keep going, right? Well, so that's one of the nice, interesting things about like how house numbers are assigned in the US is that they often will skip in case they decide to put another house in the middle. So same kind of idea as that. I don't, I'm gonna go back to my simpler theory in that uh, I think they just keep adding new bikes. I like the wave idea. I think that's a pretty good one, but then there's another, what's another really obvious thing that it could be. And don't forget, this is a slice of the data. So I think it's like 2015 to 2020, maybe. Um, so theoretically there were bikes before 2015 and there were bikes after uh, 2020. So, or, or there's data from before and after, my bad. Any other theories? Are you talking about the gas prices? Yeah, sorry. Um, well, like some of the bikes can be some from like the state of the station, but is that that would be like the same how popular they use? So I think that is very true. However, what I was really kind of going for here is that some of the bikes die, right? They get they wear out and they get pulled out of service. And so they 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 basically stop being listed. Because if the bike was pulled out of service before, before 2015, then it's not going to appear, right? Because I don't have any trip durations because it just went away. Or, you know, arguably there's probably some bikes, you know, in anywhere in here that um, have such a small amount that we're just not even seeing it. And maybe it got pulled out of, uh, you know, usage. Um, you know, you imagine that maybe over here, there's a couple of those that are that are actually just, they're so new, they haven't, they don't even like register on the graph, right? So kind of the point here is that when you're looking at this kind of data, it's you got to think of kind of all the different ways that these things could be happening, because then you can start to ask questions that maybe you can prove about the data. Um, however, has anybody ever heard the acronym KISS? Okay, so the acronym KISS comes from uh, keep it simple, stupid. Um, and it's kind of similar to anyone ever heard of Occam's razor? Right, so Occam's razor is the idea that um, you know the the simplest explanation, no matter how improbable, is probably true. Okay, so it's kind of the same idea. Is if you start with the most simplistic guesses as to what the data is about, it's it's more likely to be true. So it's a good place to start. You know, you may find out you're wrong, and then you go and you know do other things that are you know come up with ideas that are more complicated. But at first, I start with super simple. So my theories are that bike IDs are given out sequentially. Um, and so as a result, earlier numbered bike IDs have higher trip durations. Um, and then some bikes fall out of service and that's why they disappear from the data. Um, I think the, the remark about a bike getting distributed into a place that stops being used very much. So imagine if bike ID one, right, which theoretically would have the highest number and arguably probably does, um, actually you kind of landed in one of those places even though it has a really low number it might actually end up with a trip duration that's also very low right because it just went to a place that nobody ever picks it up from okay um so moving on all right so what i want to do next was try to investigate the theory of bikes going out of service okay so what I'm going to look at is that stop time, okay, and kind of make a, a little bit of an assumption here that if you have a stop time that at like at some point, like it stopped being there, okay? So to figure out that, we're going to grab, let's see. We're going to grab the, the, largest stop time for any bike ID. I will say the very, very end of this lecture is uh, very disappointing both for me and probably for you. So you will, you will discover that later. All right. So this is kind of trying to show what I was just trying to explain, which is that there's missing IDs, right? So in other words, we have certain uh, bike IDs that don't have a stop time at all. So theoretically, maybe they fell out of service before our data set started. Um, so they might just be completely missing. 
and I happen to, you know, like I noticed that 11's not here. Um, and so I can go and look it up individually just to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Um, and pretty soon these will get a little faster. But as you can see, right, I don't have any data for bike ID 11. One of the theories is that it's out of service or another one is that maybe they were allocated, they skipped numbers, right? Um, so the next thing we're gonna do, all right. So what I wanna now look at is let me kind of bring those two data sets together, okay? So I wanna uh, connect our durations, okay? So our, uh, the, the table we kind of did earlier here, uh, wait, where's the definition? Um, so here, so here we have our grouped by bike ID, sum of trip durations, and we stuck it in durations, okay? And now I have this lifespan table, which has the bike ID and stop times grouped up by bike ID, but with the max value. So let's say I want to make one combined table that has both. What would I use for a function there? How do I connect two tables together? Yeah, okay. Can anybody tell me what the syntax is for the join? So let me type join and then I'll look up again. All right. Who wants to tell me what, what should I put next? I don't need the title of the table. Right. So bike ID, then what's next? Uh, type of? Uh, it, no, we want the new table, which is lifespan, it's called. So lifespan. Right. So if I recall correctly, and I may be mistaken, but if I recall correctly, it'll actually default to that. I will almost never let something like this use defaults because I'm afraid of making stupid mistakes. Um, and I want to make sure that somebody else coming and looking at it later uh, will understand exactly what I'm trying to do as well as what I actually do. So just kind of a, a stylistic thing. Okay, so now I have a new table that has a bike ID. It has the total time that they've been ridden, right? And it has the last or the most recent time that they were uh, replaced, okay? And so now I'm suspecting that my data is 2015 to 2018 because the most recent is 2018 and not 2020, like I said before. Um, but it doesn't really matter that much. And so one of the things we want to start to look at is, you know, can we maybe try to do a scatter? Well, that's annoying, right? So we can't use this stop time max because it's non-numerical value. So even though it looks like a numerical value or it looks like a date time, right? It's not actually, it's just a string because we used um, the function before, basically we just kind of grabbed it as a string. Okay, so this is something you'll run into a lot. And so I wanted to demonstrate it. And one of the keys here, right, is that the, the error that, you know, the mistake you made, you made, okay, so be careful about the who the you is there. You made is always the last line or, or very near the last line. Sometimes there's some other paging in there, um, but it's the last line. So as it says here, the column stop time max contains non-numerical values. And we know that with a scatter, right, we need numerical values on both so that we can position it in the, in the field, right? And then the way you uh, try to figure out what's, what may be wrong, if, if that wasn't enough information, is it shows you that at this line, okay, you got an error, right? Except this isn't code you wrote, right? This is in this uh, project over here, this data science module that we've been using in this Python file called tables.py. And on line 4020, it got this error, okay? Well, I didn't write that code. And I'm going to bet that the data science module, the code is largely correct. It's pretty unusual to be using one of these things, especially such a common feature for me, you know, for them to have a bug, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go normally, I'm going to go to the next level up, okay? Which this is what was called to get this one down here, okay? So this is where the error was. 
in this particular file. Oh, look, it actually happens to be the same one. Okay, but it's in a very different part, right? It's at line 3,450. And if you really wanted to, you could go and look at the actual line of code if you, you know, because it is open source. But again, probably not our code. Okay. And so finally, we get back to our actual call that broke it. Okay. And the reason I'm showing you this, even though it's, you know, not necessarily the most interesting example, is because this is how you should be looking at your errors, you know, before asking like a CA or a TA or myself or another expert, right, is that make sure that this seems like a real problem versus, um, you know, one where, oh, I did exactly that. You know, I, yes, I made a mistake. I can't do this. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to convert that stop time max into some kind of number, okay? And so my first idea when I was uh, figuring this out was let me look at the duration and I'm gonna call it kind of this function called days between. So what I'm gonna look at is like, what's the duration between the, let me just make sure I, I'm gonna say this right. Um, the duration between the start of the data set and the stop time, okay? And I'm going to do that by using some stuff that you may not have seen before. Um, and won't be on an exam, but it's kind of handy to know. So I'm going to use another library called date time, intuitively enough. Um, and I'm going to use something in there that I don't think it stands for strip time, but I always read it that way because I think the SCRP is actually supposed to be short for something else, but I never remembered what it is. Um, and strip time seems perfectly plausible to me. Um, and so I happen to know, which, you know, like I wasn't sure of before, but now I am. Uh, because I have my cheat sheet, that the start date is um, 2015-0101, okay? And then I'm going to use what's called format. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Bad cut and paste. Uh, it's because I know I'm likely to mistype this. So I'm actually going to tell the date time function here what the format of the data that I'm giving it is, okay? And so the percent Y capitalized means a four digit year, a lowercase Y would be a two digit year. Obviously these days we don't really wanna use two digit years as much as possible, right? Um, but you will get data that has it because anything prior to call it 1996, people just thought 2000 was never actually going to occur. And so as a result, they just use two digit years. Um, the lowercase m means that you have a two-digit month, and the lowercase d means you have a two-digit day, okay? So then, I'm gonna do something else, which is, okay, so I'm passing in the end date, okay? So that's the stop time max, okay? It's the same field. And then what I'm gonna do is, okay, I've got the start date, okay, but I don't have a time, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take the end date, split it on the space, because I know what the data looks like. There's a space right here, right? And then I'm gonna pull out and not very intelligently um, call that end date. And then let me just see. Oh, no, that is right. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, I don't care about the time, my bad. Um, I'm just going to do it by day, so it doesn't make any difference. But I need just the um, date part so that I can get the end date, right? So I need to get rid of the time because I don't want it to get thrown off by kind of triggering it across a day. So that's what I'm doing here. I misspoke. So end date, I'm going to split it on the space, and I'm going to take the first position. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to get the first in the array back, and that will be just the date itself. And then I'm going to actually use the same, basically the same function here, um, except that now I have my end date. And so now I have a little function that once I return something, right, um, I can get back uh, the, the days in between those two dates. All right, so how, what should I use to get the days back in between? So now imagine that I have a start date and an end date and they're both numbers. What can I do to 
to get a good result. Okay, and is there any other modifications I would make to it? Right, because what's that? That's going to give me a, a value back, right? What, what's what's going to happen here sometimes, or potentially sometimes? Negatives, right? So what should I do instead? Absolute value, because again, I care about the difference, not the distance, or the distance, not the uh, uh, direction. And then because this is actually a date object, I'm actually going to use this uh, field called days. Um, and so I get the actual number of days back, uh, rather than like a numeric, like the way they're stored internally, I'll just get it like a number back that doesn't really mean days. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but that, if I pass that days, it'll tell me the actual number of days. Um, and then I have a little test for it, except I have a missing paren somewhere. No, I have an extra paren. All right, and so if I just pass in this date, I get 455. Um, and, you know, at one point I probably actually checked the math, but I am not doing it now uh, just to make sure that it gives me what I expect. Okay, so there's 455 days between the start of the data set and the last time we saw this date. Okay. Um, and actually, it's funny, like every time, every time I go through this, I think of other ways I could have approached this problem that might be better. Um, so this whole thing kind of in reverse might have also been interesting, like how many days between now and the last time we saw it might be a, a better way to think about this data rather than the way I'm doing it. Um, so, all right, so now what do I do to get an array back of all the, you know, just the days, right? So now I, I wanna create a new column, right? Like I'm doing here. And so I want life days. What do I do to get that element back or to get that information? How can I convert all of those thought time maxes to days, basically, in one line of code? No, what I need to do is I need to actually modify every single one of them and basically pass it into this function and get the number of days back for that stop time. Other ideas? You've used this a bunch. Apply, right? And so the reason I, I particularly call this one out is because if you're not using apply a lot, you probably should be and probably make your life easier. Because one of the things, um, there's a lot of methods, right, that we use that, um, you can actually accomplish this yourself relatively easily, like in a relatively straightforward manner. Um, but it's like four or five lines of code that you don't need to write because you already have a plot. You know what I mean? So like try to, you know, try to keep at the forefront of your mind that, hey, maybe there's a better, uh, like a simpler way of doing this. The other thing that you have the advantage of using something like apply, right, is it's less likely to have a bug because it's somebody else's code, right? So that's why I try to use um, kind of more efficient ways as much as I can. So let me just scroll my uh, cheat sheet. And so to use apply, I just pass in, wait, did I miss one? Yeah, oh, sorry, no, I didn't. All right, so I pass in the name of the function I want, and then I pass in the column that I want And now I'll have an array of just, you know, days between. Um, and then I'm going to add that as a column onto our table. And then I'm going to sort it by the days. And I'm going to actually add a print statement if I can find my mouse. So, oh, actually, it's going to print it anyway. Never mind. Ah, stupid bug. What did I do wrong? Oh, underscore, not space. Okay, so now I have a new table that has the uh, lifespan of each of the bikes. Um, and yeah, right. All right, 
So now let's take a look at what that looks like on kind of scatter plot. And as you can see, it looks about the same, right? So this is kind of, I'm mostly doing this as almost a test against the other one to make sure that what I did was like legitimate. Um, and because the picture is pretty similar, even though the scale is different or the units are different, I can see that it's probably, it's probably right, okay? I could probably also like do some real testing and check for real, but I'm just kind of eyeballing it. So I'm pretty sure it's right, but just in case. All right, so now we see that we have those striations still. All right, but then let's see if we can see a histogram of the data uh, while we're trying to explore it. So what I thought was really interesting about this, right, is that there's a lot of really old bikes in this set, right? Or bikes that get used a lot, right? Um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then as we were talking about before, the bikes are skewed to shorter trips, okay? So more bikes are have a total trip duration that's shorter, like the total time they're in use that seems to be shorter. So I just thought those two things were kind of interesting and it kind of gives us a little bit more sense of that data. Um, so, yeah, so this is the same one. Um, I wonder why I showed it twice though. Oh, I just showed it twice. I feel like I was trying to show something else. Um, but just also for uh, kind of the sake of completeness, um, there was actually a much easier way I could have done the, the date calculation if I wanted to date back instead of a string. And so I could have just used this parse method and it's usually smart enough just to figure out what the format is. I don't have to pass it in the format and stuff, as long as it's one of the kind of regular standard ones. Um, and so then I can kind of, I'll just do essentially the same thing, except this time I could just use this built-in function called parse. Um, and then I'm gonna add it to my table as last seen. And uh, then I'm gonna throw that into another scatter, okay? And so, as you can see, part of the reason that I did the with the days is because if I do this, it's it's basically unreadable. I didn't really figure out, I didn't want to figure out like how to make it more readable. Uh, so I'm just going to stick with the days because as you can see, right, it's still the same graph, kind of just, it's the same data under, underneath it all. It's just kind of different ways of representing the same piece of information. Okay, so next thing, was I was gonna kind of show you using standard units, um, that same data set. Again, the graph looks the same, but what I wanted to kind of point out is when we were talking about most of your data falling within two standard deviations, that's what's happening, right? Because in this graph, it's been pushed to the standard units. So even though the zero is over here, right? This is one standard deviation. This is two standard deviations, okay? So, you know, ignore the, the, how we decided to actually put the graphs there or the tick marks. But so kind of by, you know, random data set, pull off the internet, still follows those same rules. And we're gonna talk about more advantages of those same rules uh, in the next couple of weeks. All right, so does anyone see a relationship between these two things? Okay, I remember like, a relationship, so like a correlation between, actually here, I'll go back up to this one because I think it's a little easier to follow. So, you know, when we have a bike that has been around for, you know, whatever, 1990 days, um, and it has 2 million uh, minutes used, you know, is there is there any correlation that you see here? What do y'all think? Is there a relationship between these two things? I theorized about one earlier. What do you think is that? Is that plausible? What do you think it might be? Any ideas? Oh, sorry. Right, so we're not really sure why necessarily, right? But it does seem like maybe there's a relationship going like this, right? Like if you imagine a line, right? Is that when, when a bike hasn't been used as much, 
it tends to have been, or sorry, it hasn't been as round as long. It tends to have been used more, which is kind of weird, but you know, it's what it says, right? So what I was gonna show you next was I can calculate whether that, like what that relationship is and to some extent how strong that relationship is through what's called a correlation. Okay, and again, we're gonna talk about this more as we go uh, on. And, but what I can tell you for now is that I can use this function, which is defined above, but it, so it doesn't really matter what it is, but I'm basically gonna say, okay, I'm gonna calculate the correlation between this column and that column uh, uh, on this table, right? And so it's a negative 0.64. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that, sorry, am I reading that? Yeah, so, I feel like I feel like there's a, a bug here, but the, I don't know, whatever, sake of argument. So as you have numbers that get uh, closer to one and closer to zero and closer to negative one is kind of the relationship they have. So this is showing me, this is why I think it's wrong because I thought it came up as, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's right, sorry. Um, so this is pretty close to negative one, right? I'm just misreading it. Apparently I haven't had enough coffee today. Um, so what that means is if it's negative, it just means it's, it's like this. Okay. And if it's positive, it just means it's like this. Okay. So it's not a stronger or, or lesser than just because it's negative. It's just the distance from the ones, you know, if you think about the ones as the absolute value of them, the closer you are to one, the more of a correlation there is the closer to zero, the less of a correlation. So that seems to indicate that there's a, like a decent correlation there. And one of the things that we're going to get into over the next couple of weeks is um, when this calculation can be wrong, okay? Because there's scenarios where if you do a correlation, even though it looks like a good correlation, it's not, okay? So we'll talk about that later. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later in this as well, because like I said, it's very disappointing. Um, let me just catch up on my cheat sheet. Um, okay, so... What I'm going to do now is, okay, if I have a correlation, does that mean, so that means that I can actually do some level of prediction, right? And so what I want to do is, um, sorry, I wanted to see, okay. Um, so what I want to do is a prediction. So I have another function up there that's going to basically take the data that I have and then predict where the data should be okay so in other words like i have a value on the x-axis okay and i want to predict where on the y-axis it should be okay so that i can say where is this dot okay and one of the ways i can do that is by like kind of looking at the real data and then starting to extrapolate from that and so the first thing we do here is we basically just predict all of the oh sorry and so that method and one of the reasons I left this method name out is because the term for prediction tends to be more formally referred to as fitted okay and the difference between it is that fitted so uh so fit like a pair of gloves okay so it means like you forced it into that spot right whereas like a true prediction is me saying Here's who's going to win the Super Bowl next year, okay? And because I'm, you know, super intelligent and know everything there is to know about football, that's why I can predict that this this will be the team that will win in Super Bowl. Um, a fitted one means more like I've calculated based on all the stats of the NFL um, who is most likely to win the Super Bowl. And if you if you think about it, right, we call them models, right? And we kind of push the model into, you know, think about like a glove. We fit it onto it, okay? However, a lot of the time you'll hear the term fit or fitted and prediction kind of interchangeably. But that's why there's kind of a distinction. Um, even though when we're speaking about it, we tend to use them semi-interchangeably. I even use them interchangeably in this method, right? Like even in this code. Um, so, but they mean the same thing. It's just that one is kind of a little more nuanced than the other. Okay. So what I get is you know, not great predictions, at least in the examples that we see. Um, but let's kind of keep running it out and see what happens. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out, like, again, this is not something that you'll see on a test, 
but it can be super handy if you set the format for a you know a column to the number formatter, for example. I think I showed this before um, because this is much easier to read, right, than something that's in scientific notation, unless you know the scientific notation is useful. I think scientific notation is much easier to read when the numbers are really, really small, like so, you know, to the right of the decimal. Um, but when there are numbers that are in front of the decimal, uh, I think it's much easier to read the real number rather than scientific notation. So that's why I switched it. Um, but long story short, uh, so there we have some predictions based on our, you know, our function that does the fitted values. But what I wanted to get at was the way we do that is by let me see. I can't remember if I still have. Yeah, I should have. Uh, I had another uh, block of code in here that I probably should, that I should have left because it shows something nicely. Um, let me see if I can write it quickly. I'll point it out. Um, we're going to talk about it more later, but what we can do is we can say, okay, I'm going to take my, uh, you know, my same table there. I'm going to drop a bunch of columns so that they don't kind of get thrown into the scatter. Um, and then I'm going to scatter plot on just the life days. Okay. So life days will be on our X and then I'll actually end up with um, two different Y's values. I'll end up with both the, um, actual total trip duration and the predictions, um, right? Yeah. Um, and then the next thing I was gonna show, uh, show you, and this is what I was saying is that the, the graph's a little better, or the, the other picture I had is a little better for showing this, is that the way we do this is what we do is we figure out based on the data we have, where is the line that fits the most places, okay? So that correlation, indicates that there's a line that goes like this through here. And so if we can get a bunch of spots on that line, then maybe we can figure out what the shape of that line is. So does anybody remember what the formula for a line is? Anybody remember doing this in math? Right, so y equals mx plus b, um, which, so m, okay, is uh, the slope. Okay, and B is the intercept. Okay, and so I'm going to calculate those two things using again functions right here, which I have written above, and we're going to talk about more later. Okay, and so what the slope is, right, is is basically the angle of the line. Okay, and the intercept is where it crosses the x-axis. Okay, so like eventually, right, every line will cross the x-axis that you set. It like, may not be in the graph, but eventually it's gonna cross, right? So the intercept is, is what is the y, or what is the value of that at that point? Um, and so what we can do is if we find the slope and we find that intercept off of that same data, then, well, I'm just printing it out there, but then I can draw a line with that uh, slope and intercept on the graph, which has my, uh, my what's the variable? Um, my scatter. And so the reason, so you can't, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually yellow underneath the red. Um, but basically the yellow is all the spots of the predictions. Okay. <laughs> and so you can see what it'll, what it does is it lines up. Actually, I could just hide the red line. That would work. I think. Ah. Nope. Oh my goodness. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is what I was trying to show before. So these yellow dots, right, are where the prediction landed, okay? So the samples we saw in the table that I showed are like, you know, they're somewhere in here, but they didn't really kind of fall in this line. But as you can see, it is actually making a pretty good line, right? So we maybe we are onto something here. And so then we can kind of draw our line up here. And so now we've calculated what that line would be based on those predicted values. And so we draw the red line and we can say, okay, hey, that's, you know, there, there's something there, right? Except, and this is where it gets pressing, or we can talk about that in a minute, but what can we conclude from this prediction data? So if, 
you know, if this was all true, what do we know about that red line? And you kind of said it a minute ago, that bikes that are not in service very long tend to have higher durations. When they're in a longer service, they tend to have dropped off. So there's a couple of theories around here, right? Is that that could mean that the, the bikes are less pretty, so people don't choose them, right? And so they start dropping out of service because they look mangled, right? Because they've been used so much or for so long, let's say. Um, it could also be that there's uh, some sort of rotation thing going on here is that older bikes are getting put in the, you know, as we said before, somebody said, uh, you know, put in the suburbs, right? And so they're getting used less now because they're kind of near their end of life, right? So it's kind of interesting um, that, you know, maybe there's some relationship in here. Um, and yeah, and so I kind of said, what can we recommend that somebody do with this? Um, and I kind of alluded to those already, but like maybe what you should do is that if as a bike kind of gets older is put it, you know, put it in less well-used locations and it should last longer. So you have to replace less bikes to have the same volume of bikes in total, right? Because that's what you care about as the bike, you know, delivery people, right? Is that you want the same volume of bikes available but you put the ones that are maybe near their end of life in places that they'll less likely be used. Does that make sense, right? That would be a good operating model, I would think. And so, and that seems to be borne out that maybe that is what they're doing, right? Um, however, and here's the last part, when we do this stuff, a lot of it starts to work and then we test it, okay? And so what this is called is the residuals, and we'll talk about this more later, but basically this is the uh, kind of error plot, okay? And what you want it to look like is basically a big circle scatter plot, you know, with just dots everywhere, but in a big circle. What does this not look like? So this is wrong, okay? So one of the things that, you know, I'm kind of trying to make the point here, right, is that it, it all seemed to be working, right? But this is why it's so really, really important that you actually do error like checking, right? Is both both kind of error checking for like just straight bugs, which I could very well have, right? It could be that I just have a bug somewhere that I haven't caught, or it could be that the whole concept is flawed. And that remember when I said that correlation early on that you can actually get a good, like a strong correlation, but it's invalid because of certain other conditions. So I didn't check that, right? You watched me not check that. So, but this tells me kind of towards the end, right? And after a whole bunch of work, which is unfortunate, that this is not a good uh, model for predicting the kind of lifespan of these bikes or how, how they're going to be used or that we should base anything on it. But that doesn't mean there's nothing here. It just means that this particular approach seems to be mildly broken. Okay, and then we can get into, and this is again what we'll get into a little bit, right? Is like we can get into a, uh, you know, can we get a little bit more idea of why it's broken? Okay, and B, what can we do about it, right? How can we, how can we change the model or change the scenario so that maybe we can get a better prediction? One thing right off the bat, right, that we probably won't get to too much would be what if we actually need multiple data elements to do our model prediction? Okay, maybe there's something about subscribers, right, that influences how this happens. 